episode 203 of the Grip Strip Podcast. Uh, yeah, here we go. Out of the playoffs uh, edition of the Grip Strip Podcast. My name is Philip Matthew. I'm your host. I'm with my co host, the iRacing Indy 500 champion, computer genius, a gentleman, and a scholar. And he raced in the US 500 and got his face in uh, on the show itself. His name is Joshua Fine. What's going on, brother? <laughs> yes, uh, the Cowboys lost, uh, but yeah, I did race in the uh, uh, US 500 uh, on iRacing this past weekend, so we'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, good good racing here, good to be back on IndyCar in the, uh, officially uh, in uh, iRacing competition, so uh, glad uh, to participate in that, uh, and yes, my face was on there, uh, but of course, the playoffs this uh, past weekend, of course, uh, a lot of surprising results. Uh, here, but um, you know, I think the obviously the Cowboys losing, producing the uh, most uh, hilarious content, of course, uh, with uh, Stephen A. Smith uh, mocking the Cowboys as usual, and of course he's on a big week anyways. But um, um, yeah, this uh, playoff series is pretty interesting, and of course right now we've got the Bucks up thirteen nothing over the Philadelphia Eagles, and they may fire their coach after this if they lose. So um, this one's pretty interesting to watch and see how that plays out. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, you got Philly. Well, he just made that big pass and he might go to the house. Oh man, that tackle was huge. Um, Devontae Smith got, ran a post, a skinny post and got around the corner there. Uh, But we're going to talk about all the games so far and including this game that's going on right now, Super Wild Card Weekend. Um, we'll also talk about coaching news, executives, uh, not really as much stories on the executives. I think all the ones that were gone or going to go are gone. Uh, maybe, I mean, who knows, but, uh, we'll get into all that. We'll go and update everyone on the chili bowl. What took place in Tulsa, uh, last weekend, Dakar rallies in the second week. Uh, Super Motocross ran in the muck in San Francisco. Um, Formula E started their 2024 season in Mexico City at uh, uh, Hermanos Rodriguez Circuit. Uh, Talk about SRX ending up being uh, postponed and probably done. IROC, though, is coming back with... uh, Ray Everham, uh, who was involved in SRX on the front end of it, and then Rob Kaufman, who's, for whatever reason, saved Michael Waltrip Racing, and then now, and then was, is the reason why freaking uh, charters exist, for good or for bad. Um, we'll uh, talk about the roar before the 24. That'll be coming up this weekend, which will, um, they'll be, having practices and I think qualifying uh, to determine they'll be determining certain positioning for uh, the Rolex 24 at Daytona we'll talk about all those Uh, we will and uh, any other key news items we'll talk about the divisional round three of the four games have been determined uh, the 49ers will come off their bye week and play on Saturday night. The Baltimore Ravens will be playing on Saturday afternoon to start the divisional round. And then uh, we'll get into uh, the other matchups accordingly. We'll make our picks. I think I did pretty good uh, picks-wise uh, so far This uh, outside of the Detroit game. I, I didn't pick that one, but... Uh, I picked uh, Houston, and I picked. I went chalk on the AFC side, and I went for the lower seeds in the NFC side. And uh, Dallas won, and um, or at least for Dallas and or Green Bay won against Dallas, and then uh, I had picked uh, the Rams, but they um. They ended up uh, losing close game to Detroit, and 
now we have Philly and um, Tampa. I think I picked Tampa. I picked Tampa. I yeah. I actually picked Philly. I might be wrong yeah. here, um, but we both picked Cleveland, and I I said Cleveland would go to the Super Bowl, and obviously that that uh, prediction went up in smoke uh, there, and then. Uh, we both picked Buffalo, um, and I picked Green Bay, and you had Dallas. So, um, actually, so Did far, I have going, Dallas? yeah, I'm, I thought I picked Green Bay. No, you. Uh, it's not what you wrote here. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I guess where? Oh, NFL. Josh, you picked Cleveland over Houston. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Because you went Green Bay, I picked the other way. Oh well. Um, Kansas City. All right. Yeah, so got two. Uh, I was wrong there. Yeah. So, yeah, my picks went about as... So I thought I did better than I did. Oh, well, whatever. Um, we'll talk about all that, and we'll make our picks for the divisional round. Josh will let us know all things going on in the world of iRacing and gaming in his sim segment, and we'll call it a day. Um, let's start, though, with Super Wildcard Weekend. Start with that Cleveland and Houston matchup. Houston in their usual 430 spot on Saturday in the wild card round. But it was CJ Stroud's first uh, career start in the playoffs. Uh, and he uh, did work all day. And um, the Houston defense made... Joe Flacco pay. I guess Joe Flacco decided to become Joe Flacco again. Um, through two pick sixes. And uh, that was essentially it. You know, C.J. Stroud played really, really well, of course. And that team in general, the f- crowd was lively. The energy was there. But Stroud got, the, got them going. And uh, the defense went and put them away. And really, that that was it. I mean, the Cleveland defense is the number one defense in the NFL, but they didn't show up on Saturday. Um, you can make the argument that because of how Flacco played, that affected it. But, I mean, they, they it was a shootout early in the game. I think it was 14-all. Um, they were trading trading touchdowns early, and then um, the kind of the game turned on Cleveland turnovers. So... Uh, surprising, considering how Cleveland had been playing leading into the playoffs, adding the fact that Houston had to had to back in, so to speak, to get into the playoffs after all the carnage that went on in the AFC South. Um, but D'Amico Ryan's had his crew ready. C.J. Stroud was ready for the big time. Um Proving once again that with NFL and um, scouting and in terms of player uh, evaluations probably are just a bit overrated with some of the things they use. Um, And I bet you the Carolina Panthers wish that they had drafted C.J. Stroud. Um, But uh, and then also Will Anderson actually made a couple of plays there as well. So. the number two and number three overall picks in the NFL draft made a difference in that playoff game. Well, um, did you see anything else, anything that really stood out to you out of that game um, other than Cleveland just kind of going and melting down after the in the second quarter on? Well, I mean, I think, you know, that really the um, kind of the start of that meltdown was the uh, – Browns giving up that touchdown uh, in the second quarter, um, that long touchdown that the Texans scored. Uh, I think that was the start of the meltdown there. Uh, of course, uh, Larry Mintunzel, uh just body bagged uh, Miles Garrett throughout that game, and he you know, definitely definitely put him put him in a box there and never never let him affect the game. You know, Miles Garrett's been a game record this year, um, kind of one of the favorites for uh, Defensive Player of the Year. Uh, but you know, unable to go and lock that up uh, for uh, uh, for Cleveland there, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see you know how Houston does in the playoff. You know, they're going to go up against Baltimore, who they lost uh, to in Week One. So, um, kind of a circle round of the season, if you will. 
uh, for both of those teams now, with one, both of them playing extremely well, uh, especially for the Texans and everything. And um, obviously the score you know, factors in with uh, what um, Joe Flacco giving up uh, you know, 14 points to the um, the Texans there, you know, you just can't do that in the playoffs. Uh, the first one, you know, uh, they really just had to make the tackle, uh, which they failed to do on the pick six, and plus pressure really affected uh, Flacco on that throw. Uh, and then the second pick just t completely telegraphed it, going for it on fourth down, and threw it right to the linebacker who went and took it to the house. So, uh, you know, once that happened, game over, uh, of course, and the Texans... Um, go on to the second round Browns stay home and you know I think for me I guess making that pick with Cleveland you know is really leaning into the you know defense uh being the number one seed or the number one I thought they could have been the number one seed but um the uh number one overall defense in the NFL this season but of course when you take them out of Cleveland um they performed pretty poorly uh on the road so maybe I forgot to factor that in of course uh wanted to see Joe Flacco you an elite quarterback uh, in his heyday. Uh, wanted to see him go out and take them to the Super Bowl uh, because that was, in my mind, the only way that uh, this season could end. Uh, when you know one of the ugliest seasons that we've seen yet, and um, you know what better way than um, you know one of the more uglier quarterbacks in the league in terms of his play over his career, and uh, you know the ugliest team in terms of the aesthetic with their uniform uh, and their history generally uh, there. Uh, and that city too. So, um, you know, just uh, wanted to want to see that just to make a fitting ending. But of course, uh, that's not going to happen, which is okay. Uh, we'll see now Baltimore or San Francisco more than likely. Uh, but yeah, that was definitely a you know, interesting game in the first half and then just got away uh, from them, uh, the Browns and Texans in the uh, second half of the game. Yeah, just as uh, Baker got hit and he's kind of he had a he had a shot there that was i think it was is that godwin yeah or no that was kale otten or kate otten and oh man he was wide open that's crazy um yeah i mean not also pick cleveland uh and in the end they didn't perform they weren't ready for that game i guess or they weren't ready to stay with Houston in a shootout, which to be fair is not that surprising because Cleveland was more of a running and they were more of a ball control team utilizing their defense to kind of take the go and get the other team out of their game. But CJ Stroud said no way. And um, he gets uh, his gift for that is to go to Baltimore on Saturday afternoon and try to beat the presumptive MVP, Lamar Jackson, and the Baltimore Ravens, the number one seed in the AFC. The second game uh, was the uh, um, it was a Kansas City-Miami game. I mean, there really wasn't much of anything there. My, it was cold as hell. Um Taylor Swift was wearing a Christian Juszczyk jacket. Uh, Kermit the Frog did whatever he had to do. Um, Isaiah Pacheco looked like a freaking Mack truck the whole night. And um, Miami didn't put up a fight. A, the, the term finesse or finesse team really fits what that game was in a in a nutshell for Miami they really couldn't handle uh, the defensive pressure from the Kansas City defense that's the better side of the ball and it's hard it's weird to say when you're talking about Kermit the Frog and Kelsey and all that but Rashi Rice their only wide receiver of value uh, made a few big plays there too so they did what they had to do and um there was a chance that they were going to continue to stay at home uh, if ga if the games had went a certain way. But, I mean, I, I don't think it was that surprising. I think of all the matchups that were there, I think the most likely scenario was, oh, man, come on. Um, most likely scenario uh, took place there when it comes to, oh, no, that's not good. And he'd got to walk it out. But um, 
you know, Kermit in Kansas City gets the victory. Um, I mean, Tua didn't really have much anything the whole night. Tyree Kill made the one big play for a touchdown, uh, but it just didn't. The running game was never really able to get established, and you have all those guys, former 49ers like Mostert, who scored so many touchdowns this year, Jeff Wilson Jr., A-Chan really just wasn't his usual self. It just seemed like Miami was a step behind the whole night, both on offense and defense. Vic Fangio's defensive play calls were not really good or or the right ones at the at the time necessary time. So unfortunate for Mike McDaniel and uh Miami, but uh they go home to defrost and uh the Kansas City Chiefs continue. Um I mean that game was we talked about it last week. I don't think it was all that surprising, but um I do I will say this though. The Rashi Rice uh being you know existing there is key. Uh I don't know about you, but oh man, another try to pick the same second time he's done that. Um Cunningham almost picked that ball off. Um but I think Rashi Rice is gonna be huge here for the Chiefs. Uh, whatever for as long as they are around uh, in this playoff, he uh, if if he isn't open, he does. Mahomes doesn't have anybody else on the wide receiver side to throw to, and Kelsey for whatever reason has regressed this year. I mean, yeah, he's an All Pro because of his name, uh, but he wasn't an All Pro for a good part of the end part of the season there, and. And they need him because they need Rashi Rice because that's one of the only ways they're going to keep uh, Travis Kelsey open or give him the opportunities to be open. But uh, what else did you see or was in terms of that game, Josh? I mean, you make that observation about Rice, and yeah, he definitely um, after kind of most of the season where you know he uh, didn't have uh, a lot of good play, you know, had a lot of drops and stuff throughout the year. You know, one of the problems with the Chiefs this year, but um, you know, he was able to convert um, a lot of those throws that uh, Patrick Mahomes is uh, throwing to him, and really only a wide receiver that they had that was consistently making plays. You saw there is a play uh, where Mahomes, I think he was, you know, MVS down the uh, the middle um, that split the defense and had a chance, but he gave up, uh, and it was I think it ended up being a penalty, but he gave up on a deep ball. Um, that was just right in front of him. Um, that I think probably would have stood if he had, you know, laid out for the catch. But, um, um, yeah, Rice had a good game. I think one thing you have to say about Mahomes is, yeah, they didn't really have a lot of. I mean, I think because of their wide receiver situation, um, they didn't really have a lot of, uh, you know, big plays deep, you know, down the field that they're known for. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, Mahomes went out and got uh the easy plays that he needed to make. And he's able to, you know, kind of sit down and dissect the defense, uh, kind of uh, Brady esque. So if he kind of continues that play style, you know, we could very well see the Chiefs back uh, to the Super Bowl once again. Uh, if if he, uh, you know, is able to continue playing like that, and of course uh, Isaiah Pacheco definitely running hard. Nobody wanted to tackle him uh, in that game, especially in in those conditions. So uh, yeah, credit to him for being able to uh, do that. And of course, uh, you know, their defense played extremely well as. Um, you know, with Chris Jones, uh, Legereus Sneed uh, at corner playing extremely well and completely bodied um, Tyreek Hill on one play, just completely took him out of the play uh, um, before, I think it was, yeah, before half, uh, and Tua couldn't go anywhere and he ended up getting sacked. So, um, yeah, that was a good play by their defense. And then, of course, um, you know, Tua Tagovailoa, um, a lot of questions about him, I think, after this game. You know, especially if you know he's able to create anything out of structure, it seems like he really relies on you know the the playbook. You know, kind of playing itself out and being able to uh, take take the shots that he's able to down the field. And um, you know, with uh, Tyree kind of banged up, makes it a little bit more difficult. Of course, their offensive line 
uh, had struggles as well with uh, a lot of their players injured. Uh, so that affected him. But, you know, in those conditions, cold weather, you know, negative 23 wind chill, uh, you know, the fourth coldest game in NFL history, um, you know, got to be able to deliver and um, just uh, his arm strength compared to Mahomes uh, just uh, doesn't compare. Uh, so you have that. Um, and then, of course, uh, um, you know, discourse of uh, Tua, you know, after the game online, I know one one account that I saw had said that, oh, they should try to get Kirk Cousins in the offseason photoshopping a quickly, uh, you know, Microsoft Paint version of Kirk Cousins in a uh, Miami Dolphins uniform. So um, that could be an interesting development uh, if they go for it, uh, of course. And, you know, I think one thing, one play that does describe his arm strength in these conditions is that play action pass that he had uh, to Tyreek Hill that went for a touchdown. Uh, you saw it was second and one, which is a good situation for a shot play uh, for a potential touchdown play action pass. And, you know, he threw it down the field, but it was short of Tyreek and he had to stop and come back for it. And then that caused uh, the defender on the Chiefs uh, uh, to go and commit pass interference uh, there. So uh, definitely uh, kind of shows the difference between Tua and maybe what Mahomes would look like in that scenario. Uh, so. Um, that's going to be something that they think about, even though it ended up being a touchdown, just um, made it a lot a lot more difficult uh, for Tyreek. It wasn't in stride like I think if Mahomes were in that situation, probably would. So uh, that's definitely something to think there. And I think, you know, also McDaniel, um, for as good as everybody wanted to praise him uh, this season for how he how he played or coached, um, yeah, I think uh, one thing that he's got to be able to do is evolve his playbook. And, you know, beyond, beyond what they were able to do, I think teams figured them out and, you know, the plays that work, you know, against lesser teams that, you know, work in September, you know, you got to make adjustments over the season. I think that was something that doomed them is that they didn't make enough uh, adjustments to the playbook uh, to, you know, you know, cause cause more confusion and disruption like uh, like we saw at the beginning of the year. So uh, we'll see what they decide to do here in the off season. But, you know, I think they're looking to get some of their players back from injury and you also looking to see where they can get better. Yeah, and there's always room for improvement. Two years in the, in oh, yeah, he got that catch though, and he still held on. Uh, two years in as a head coach and two playoff appearances for uh, Mike McDaniel in Miami for a long time. Miami hadn't been in the playoffs, or it had been pretty rare. So, in that sense, it's good. Now, would they need to? progress and actually make some uh changes maybe personnel wise or make the i mean the point that you bring josh in terms of evolving the playbook uh, is necessary uh because it's the playoffs there everybody's going to know everything you're doing so you have to be able to change it up and and on the fly even so uh Unfortunately for Miami, they weren't able to do it. Cold got to them too, so it is where they they are what they are. Oh, that's Julio Jones. Jesus, I forgot he was on the Eagles. Um, yeah, so that was the second game, and then of course the reason why we named this show what we did um, was the Dallas Green Bay game. Um, I was preoccupied for a good amount of the day uh, with uh, my bowling and practice, but I was in my car driving to practice and saw 27 to nothing. And I'm like, is that a misprint? And actually it wasn't because uh, old Dakota, Mr. Sleep Number Bed, uh, was put to sleep because of... Uh, pick six and an, and another interception that ended up leading to a touchdown. Um, necklace Mike McCarthy doing what he always does, which is fall short in the playoffs. Oh, that's a tight. Oh, man. That's what they needed. That's a huge play there. Um, Green Bay just dominated them in every aspect, really. Um, even though Green Bay's defense is not exactly the is not really good uh, under most metrics. They were able to lock down Dallas for a good amount of the game. Once it was out of reach, 
course, uh, they were able to score when it didn't count for anything. Uh, Prefs got through for over 400 yards, but in the end, most of those yards were, and that's a touchdown for the Eagles. So now Tampa Bay has to pick it up because they had been kicking field goals here last couple of possessions. They need to really pick this stuff up. Um, Green Bay, Jordan Love in his playoff debut looked like he had been playing 10 years in this league. They're on a heater these last few weeks. The same thing, I mean, Miami was on the downswing. They'd been losing a bunch of games. You look at, um, and then you look at uh, Cleveland. They were on a heater, heater, sort of, but they didn't finish, and he jumped. And then um, in the Dallas game, they were able to do what they had to do to win the division and get the number two seed which in a lot of people were thinking they were going to go and um, advance to the NFC Championship game and be able to play against the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, But you have to win one, you have to win the first game, and they didn't even put up a fight. And uh, that was pretty embarrassing. They haven't made a decision in terms of if they're going to keep Mike McCarthy, but more if you can i think it's pretty safe to say that he's going to be sent by jerry jones um jerry jones i mean no matter what they can say whatever they want to say but the reality is he's part of the problem and just like other owners that are that have too much power and have too much say um did they stop it they stopped it they stopped the tush push on the two pointer. Oh, that's something. Okay. All right. Wow. The first documented in history, probably. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this this yeah. is amazing. Finally. <laughs> yeah, somebody freaking stopped the Tush Bush after the um encroachment or no uh, after the the what do you call false start. And yeah, he didn't even get close. Delay on the jump. Or no, he got stuffed to the point he never he never got a chance to jump. Great job by the Tampa Bay defense. Um, yeah, there. So keeps it a one possession game, sixteen to nine. Hopefully, Tampa Bay can actually make something happen this possession. This possession. Um, but I mean, there's a lot to take away. I mean. Um, uh, Ferguson had three scores, but Dallas's defense, freaking Micah Parsons, who talked lots of shit for a lot of the season, but oh, I didn't see Homeboy yesterday, and I haven't really seen Homeboy do much of anything uh, last few weeks uh, for a guy who talks a lot. And Dak Prescott, who gets paid, what, $40 million a year, and they're talking about possibly a giving him a extension to pay him $60 million a year. And for what? I mean, uh, because they can't get anybody else. I mean, I guess you talked about the Kirk Cousins thing. I mean, it depends on who the coach is, and there's rumors about it being Bill Belichick. But um, it, what it, is, is Dak Prescott capable of making it happen? Do we do they have the pieces in place to really be a contender? Their secondary um, injuries wise, it started to make a a difference. Uh, Deron Bland is an interception or nothing cornerback. Stephon Gilmore's on the back end of his career. Um, you know they don't really they didn't really have an identity running wise, even though Tony Pollard was capable. And Mike McCarthy started getting away from the run game, which I re- ironically was part of the thing he said when Kellen Moore resigned that they were passing the ball too much, so we were going to go and run the ball more. Well, when you're down 27 to nothing, you're not going to be running the ball, but I, I, I just find it hilarious. Uh, the Kyle Brandt did his usual um, 
a deal on GMFB talking about the Cowboys because that's just what the Cowboys have been since 1990, since 1996. Um, they may make the playoffs, but they always fall short. They're all talk because uh, they're the biggest franchise in American sports, but in the grand scheme of things, the uh, amount of playoff games that they've won, the fact they haven't even made the NFC Championship game since uh, the 1995 season is uh, pretty god-awful. And um, Jerry Jones is part of the is a big reason why because he was the idiot that decided to fire Jimmy Johnson, and they said, "Oh, putting Jimmy Johnson into the uh, whatever the Ring of Honor was going to break that curse." Well, guess that curse is still around. Um, I. I mean, the, this weekend's been interesting in terms of the teams being sent, but Dallas also losing. I thought they were gonna, they could have had a run in them, and um, I mean that that's about as bad of a performance as you could put up there. Um, didn't even there, no fight, no energy, no nothing. I mean, it's basically Mike McCarthy in a nutshell. Uh, because he's like a jellyfish too, just like uh, Wade Phillips, but um, and he's necklace like Peter Griffin and that Fanta guy who announces bowling for Fox. But what other did you see? I mean, I'll just throw it to you, Josh. I mean, Dak Prescott, man. I don't get what the what the thing is. He's a. I guess they're a great fan. They're good for fantasy purposes. And he had a year that theoretically he was an MVP candidate, but MVPs make big play. Oh man, that was a huge catch. Um, but Prescott, yet again in the playoffs, when he needed to do make a big play, he went the other way. Yeah, I mean for Dak, I mean it, it was just bad all around, right? Uh, I mean, it's just a classic choke by the uh, Cowboys in the playoffs. And, um, you know, it's interesting that they go up against the Packers and um, Jordan Love looking like kind of a cross between Brett Favre and Rodgers. You know, they have that same kind of throw. I mean, Rodgers, I think, has a very quick release, but just, just the way that he kind of goes, Jordan Love goes out there and throws the ball like, how his you know feet move around in the pocket and how he steps into his throw just it looks it looks like off platform and somehow he makes it work uh but you know he they they just really ran the ball really well um and especially in the second half uh there but you know Dak was really off uh throughout uh the first half of that game and of course through the pick six uh, which you know, obviously we have uh, seen Dallas do that, but now it's happened happened to them now, uh, and especially in their house. But um, yeah, just completely off for most of the first half. And interesting that the score ended up being twenty seven to seven uh, for the second consecutive year in a wild card game, of course. But of course, um, the Green Bay Packers were able to run the ball in the second half and kind of put them away uh, early on. And um, obviously, the Cowboys kind of clawed back into it as far as uh uh score goes but you know it's just been a, a lot of a lot of effort to to be able to try to go for uh you know down down two scores try to go for a touchdown and then uh get a uh uh onside kick there that was probably more than likely never going to happen uh but um yeah just a interesting deal as as that uh whole whole uh, thing went out and of course, um, you know, with Mike McCarthy possibly on the hot seat, of course, there's been a lot of uh, talk throughout the league about Bill Belichick, uh, who has a good relationship with uh, the Jones family there in uh, Dallas, if he would possibly go down there and uh, coach for the Cowboys for a, a few short years, uh, probably into retirement. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, of course, yeah, Mike McCarthy. I mean, it's hard to hard to fire a guy off a, a twelve uh you know win win season, right? 
you know, and having consecutive playoff appearances and uh, three consecutive years making the playoffs. But it's just, uh, you know, the way that it's happened, you know, they haven't gotten further than the divisional round ever. And uh, just knowing that, oh, well, if you think that this coach can do more than, uh, you know, 12 wins, can you keep him? Or if you think you can get a guy who can get the same output and more. So um, it's interesting to see how that play, how will play out. But, um, you know, just entertaining. You know, I think I think every fan in the NFL that's not a Cowboys fan wants to see the Cowboys lose, no matter what, because you know they're always overhyped. You know, they they get they get like almost all the prime time games ever in in the, the league. You know, in a lot of years they get prime time games when they don't deserve it. So it's just entertaining to see them uh, lose in that style, uh, of course. And then on the other end, the Packers. Um, no one thought that they'd be there. So you know, honestly, it's hard hard to see a seven seed go out and win against a two seed and they went out and did it. So, um, obviously they're, they're going to go play the, uh, 49ers here. Um, and kind of another rematch in the, um, 49ers and the, and the, the Packers that they've had in the playoffs over the last few years. But i am interesting to see how Jordan love goes up against that 49ers defense. But, um, yeah, just a good game overall for, for them. Uh, and being out, going out, and kind of proving that you know they they're a real team here uh, in this playoffs. Yeah, and I mean he was able to spread the ball around to getting it to um, you know Wicks for the one score. He was able to get it to Mus Musgrove on uh, or Musgrave Musgrove whatever the hell uh, on one touchdown and. Uh, I mean, it just seemed like uh, Jordan Love was throwing darts uh, the whole day. He didn't really have a lot of resistance. Um, and that's when when you're able to just basically dictate from the from under from behind the um, behind the line there. I mean, that's uh, you got to. Yeah. You got to go and and give credit to him on that. Um, Aaron Jones looked like his old self going out there and controlling the ball with the run. Um, why am I for Re Romeo Dubs? That's the other one. Uh, he's another one that made plays. Um, he just got sacked. Oh man, yeah. Um, then. Yeah, so Philly gets another stop. So now all of a sudden, um, yeah, so Philly has a chance now with 142 to go to get tie the game here going into halftime. But Green Bay was, and, and Matt LaFleur, they were prepared all around to put them away, and they did. It was in the first half, and Jordan Love now has that test uh, next Saturday night against uh, the San Francisco 49ers, who come off their week off uh, as the number one seed. And Fletcher Cox should have gotten a penalty there, but they didn't bother to. Uh, and so we'll see what happens with that. We'll talk about that later. Uh, the Detroit. LA game was the one game I think this whole weekend that was compelling so far. I mean, this game is close. Oh, he fucking, he muffed the damn punt, or whoever the hell that is muffed the punt and got away with it. And um, but for Detroit, uh, for Jared Goff, the former number one overall pick for the LA Rams. Uh, going against Matthew Stafford, who was a former number one overall pick for Detroit, spent many years, a good amount of his career in Detroit. Got trade, they got traded for each other. He goes and promptly wins a Super Bowl. Um, Goff was a throw in essentially in that trade, and in this night, uh. In that in that situation, on that in the first time in 30 years for Detroit to have a home playoff game, the fans showed up. 
and Jared Goff showed up, played one of the best games of his career. Uh, they seemed Detroit seemed to have an ability to to do whatever they wanted on offense as well, because the LA defense has been kind of mediocre at best this year. They do have the defensive line. They do have um, Aaron Donald, but they have the rookie guy and stuff, but they haven't had a lot behind that. Uh, they weren't really able to have an answer for Amon Ross St. Brown. They didn't really have an answer for the running game. Detroit on the other side, of course, they're not, their defense isn't exactly the greatest either, but you know, they have um, Aiden Hutchinson, you know, who is a dynamic pass rusher, and they were make they were able to make enough stops, force field goals instead of touchdowns, and uh, Detroit gets the victory, twenty four to twenty three. They're able to hold off the L.A. Rams. I thought the Rams they've been they've had momentum here. I thought that they were going to go and it was going to be another matchup against the 49ers. But uh, instead, they go and lose that game, and they get to go home as well. Motor City Dan Campbell uh, takes them first coach since Wayne Fonts to win a playoff game for the Detroit Lions. And they get to host another playoff game uh, Sunday afternoon uh, against whoever wins this game between uh, Tampa and Philly. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, The Buffalo game uh, was against Pittsburgh. It got moved to got moved to Monday because of a blizzard uh, or whatever big snowstorm uh they almost got them there uh then um in in the end uh Balt- buffalo baltimore buffalo was up 21 nothing uh, early josh allen essentially st- i don't know why he isn't being considered for mvp maybe because he turned the ball over a lot or whatever they had that off period but Honestly, if we're going to talk about most valuable players, Josh Allen is one of the most valuable players in the league because if Buffalo doesn't have him, they probably win three or four games. Uh, so he he did his job out there. Buffalo suffered a couple of big injuries during the game. And, um, and so with Terrell Bernard and I think a corner, so that is something to look at going into next week. Uh, but they ha- end up holding off Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh did make a run. Mason Rudolph's able to get a couple of scores. They blocked a field goal, um, and they were able to get momentum. But in the end, uh, Shakir gets a takes a swing pass from Josh Allen. State almost gets tackled, gets back up and runs it into the end zone, and that was really the turning point of the game. Uh, And Buffalo now gets... They get to go and play Kermie at home instead of being on the road, which, for whatever reason, between the playoffs... I mean, the playoffs, it's because of uh, seeding, but in the regular season... For whatever reason, um, they insist on sending Buffalo always to Kansas City. Um, in this case, for the first time in his uh, career, Patrick Mahomes will go on the road for a playoff game. So I think that's as much as as intriguing as anything. We'll talk about it later, but Buffalo did what they had to do today. Um, the fan base, of course, coming out to go and plow out Highmark Stadium. And, I mean, they they were able to do, they, they kind of controlled it the whole, for most of the night. Yeah, there was a time there for Pittsburgh. They started to get a little momentum, but Josh Allen is just, I mean, he's unstoppable when he decides he wants to be. And, um, 
And that's, I mean, that's really all there is to it. I mean, uh, we really have to go and look at, I mean, how, I guess the greater conversation is about that game that they're going to have next week, but Pittsburgh put up a fight. Um, Omar Epps, I just read on NFL.com, walked out of the press conference when they asked him about his future. So um, I guess he's a little bit edgy about that, um, even though he's won, he's had a winning season every year of his uh, coaching career, uh, Super Bowl winning head coach. Only the third head coach they've had in a like about fifty something year span or whatever the hell it is with Pittsburgh. That's why Pittsburgh is a winning organization. But um they do have a quarterback situation that uh they're gonna end up having a competition in in training camp if they don't bother to improve the quarterback position itself. Um so I mean we'll see what happens with Pittsburgh there. But um, what do you, I mean, Josh Allen, that's really, that's period, end of story, right, Josh? Yeah, I mean, I think Josh Allen here is the story uh, of obviously made the plays throughout this game uh, to win. Um, of course, going up 21 nothing early in the game helps. And of course, that 52-yard run uh, for a touchdown, um, you know, un- unfathomable to see, especially with, how uh, the tackling uh, that was attempted was very poor, and I guess the uh, defense on the Steelers just didn't know what to do with the quarterback going out on a scramble uh, for a 52-yard touchdown. You know, that's just honestly, I mean, even if you're not a Steelers fan or anything, it's just like, yeah, that's just bad bad football there. Um, and the tackling there, I mean, I think uh, a lot of the reasons why we see you know bad tackling now here. Uh, in the NFL throughout is just because of the rules and you know how they make uh, the rules to protect the offense and favor the offense really with um, you know um, where where they're allowed to make hits and stuff and especially with the quarterback you know it's hard to go out and lay out a quarterback going on a scramble because you're in fear of the penalty so um, you know you, you try try some other way and uh, it doesn't really work and that's what happened there so um and him breaking all those tackles and everything. So uh, just, uh, you know, for the Bills, I mean, they took care of business. I don't really think anybody could have really pictured a Steelers upset win. Um, yeah, they made made it kind of interesting uh, later on in the game into the fourth quarter. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the Bills, you know, they were just, uh, I think, too much uh, for, uh, Buff- or for uh, Steelers there. So, um, yeah, I mean... I think this one's probably the more least uh, surprising uh, one there to see happen. But yeah, now Buffalo gets to host uh, the Kansas City Chiefs. So we're going to see what uh, the Chiefs-Bills rivalry, I guess, that this is kind of turning into looks like at home and uh, uh, for them. And we'll see how, how they do next week. But And especially, you know, with the weather as it is right now. So that should be a good game. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I think for the Steelers, of course, quarterback controversy, they're going to have to figure out something there because I, I don't think either Kenny Pickett or uh, Mason Rudolph, obviously, are the future uh, uh, for that franchise. And then Mike Tomlin possibly leaving. Um, I mean, I think I think he got to continue for a few years at least. Um, yeah, I know he's not as young as what he used to be, but uh, you know he's been... Um, yeah, they haven't won in the playoffs in a long time, but... You know, it's hard to argue for a coach that, you know, puts you in a position, uh, argue against a coach that puts you in a position uh, to make the playoffs every year. There's, you know, really, really, you know, have not had a losing season. And even in the years where, you know, they ended up maybe not making the playoffs, you know, they were still in contention or um, their team, you know, always uh, fights, fights hard uh, to the bitter end. So Steelers, you know, they um, will have to answer those questions here in the offseason. And of course, you know, some of their players, George Pickens and um, others, you know, need to play better with more effort. But, um, you know, they uh, overall, you know, especially defense and running attack, they they figure out how to get it done. Yeah, and that's something that we'll definitely see Pittsburgh it, if they were to move on from uh, Mike Tomlin, it would be. 
unprecedented uh, considering the history of this franchise. Um, the only the both uh, Chuck Knoll and Bill Cower retired, um, and that was why the the changes took place. Otherwise, uh, they have not made a coaching change um, based on performance. Uh, since I don't know, probably the freaking sixties. <laughs> I mean, so uh, that's uh, that's unbelievable. But um, they do have a quarterback problem. They've had a quarterback problem since Ben Roethlisberger retired. Um, so it's something that is going to have to be addressed, uh, whether it's in the draft or in free agency, uh, for sure. And yeah, the Buffalo bu- uh, game against Kansas City which will be on Sunday at evening will be the box office game of the week. The one that Tony Romo, it's like Tony Romo's like fantasy bowl um, because he whacks it to both uh, Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen anyway. So, um, and Jim Nance can't get enough of it. He's another one. Uh, so that's what will be for that game. Uh, the one game, uh, obviously, as I said, is to be determined. The other team or the other half of the Detroit matchup will be determined later on tonight. Um, whoever wins between Tampa and Philly. Uh, Philly, for whatever inexplicable reason, they were trying to arrange or get a field goal here late to get it within four points through a ball inside with no timeouts to Gainwell gets tackled and runs out the clock. Um, I'll say Devontae Smith is playing at a level, which is why he won the Heisman Trophy. I mean, he seems to be getting open at with regularity and um, making plays. But outside of Devontae Smith, uh, there's, I mean, there's uh, little bits from Goddard, but Jalen Hurts, the hand is affecting him a little bit. Um, he doesn't seem to be as um, good as he had been. The defense is playing all right because they've kind of locked down on Baker Mayfield. So we'll see what happens in general with the second half coming. Uh, going through the coaching uh, situation here, um, We have, what, seven coaching vacancies. Uh, Eight, it was eight, but uh, the New England Patriots had a succession plan where um, Gerard Mayo would become the head coach once Bill Belichick ended up uh, uh, either they moved on from him. Uh, Well, that's great. Um and you talk about uh, that, so wow, it would have actually been pretty close at those two if it was just between those two. But um, I mean, you look at uh, the other jobs here. Uh, there's been the only things that have been decided are the New England Patriots uh, head coach and um, Washington hiring 49ers assistant GM Adam Peters to become their new general manager. So, um, and also Gerard Mayo becomes the youngest head coach in the NFL at 37 years of age. So, um, so that is, that's uh, the news. And I mean, Jim Harbaugh won the national championship last week, and now it looks like he is probably coming to the NFL again or coming back to the NFL. It's just a matter of where. Um, interviewing for a few jobs. You got Antonio Pierce interviewing for a few jobs. On, I mean, I think the Raiders are more than likely going to bring him back. Uh, that seems like the logical scenario, but uh, you have to wonder what... Um, you have to wonder what the... Uh, they're going to do there and if he doesn't get it if he would get another 
uh, opportunity elsewhere, like Atlanta. Um, I mean, Carolina is still looking. They they have uh, uh, unlimited funds um, and a shitty owner who's a billionaire. You know, Chicago got rid of a bunch of their coaches, so Eberflus, the performance of the team late in the season saved him. Um, and they have the number one in 10 overall picks going into the draft this uh, April, but the offense is going to change around a lot because of all the coaches that were let go. Uh, we talked about Jacksonville in uh, detail. Josh passionately um, let us know what's going on. I don't think I do agree that they didn't really get rid of the problem. Uh, or problems by getting rid of uh, Caldwell or Bernie Parmalee, but we'll see what happens with that. The Raiders, I mentioned with uh, Antonio Pierce, uh, they also need to get a general manager. Same for the Chargers. Um, and then the Giants, they haven't, it doesn't say that they they moved on from uh, uh Wink Martindale, but uh, I think that's yeah, I basically think they did. done. Uh, well, it's uh, see, the only reason I'm saying that is because it's not on the NFL coaching tracker, but I felt like they did, so I don't know. Uh, it's, that's a misprint there, maybe. Yeah, I thought uh, he Pittsburgh. resigned. Yeah, yeah, he did, actually, so yeah, my bad. Um, uh, yeah, Pittsburgh, they replaced... Uh, Canada, so we'll see if that continues, of course, if Omar Epps continues as the coach. Tennessee, Mike Vrabel gets canned. Uh, he's probably someone who's going to get a, a, another option, another opportunity, uh, being a winning head coach and having uh, six years in the league and taking uh the Titans to the playoffs three times along with one AFC championship game. Washington, I mentioned with Adam Peters, so they're going to be cleaning house on the coaching side with uh, and looking for somebody new. I think they were talking about uh, Detroit's uh, Ben Johnson. They are also looking at, there's a couple other guys, a couple other assistants that seem to be uh, standing out to them, but Washington will be one. Washington, Carolina, because of the amount of money uh, the owners have, probably are curious. Chargers, uh, if Jim Harbaugh goes there, what will the Spanoses do? Because they've had quite a checkered history, um, especially with um, management and coaching. Uh, and also the Raiders, too, to be fair, because of Mark Davis. But, um, oh, that's why parting ways. There you go. That's why it's over there. Um, and then Seattle also with Pete Carroll being, um, yeah, he didn't want to quit, but uh, the Allens uh, decided that they wanted to move on from him. So we'll see what happens there. Um, yeah, I mean, Atlanta looks like right now have interviewed eight different uh, coaches. Carolina's gone through a very in-depth and thorough search, uh, not only on the head coach side, but the GM side. Raiders, not as much. Um They've done a little bit with the um, GM search. Um, Chargers have, and then a bunch of requests, bunch of requests. Uh, oh, my God. Greg Roman. I'd feel bad for Justin Fields if he ends up with Greg Roman as his offensive coordinator. Um, yeah, so that's that. I mean... Uh, before we move forward on anything, uh, Josh, I guess I I have to ask you with Jacksonville, what have you heard in regards to 
the coaches, any um, news or rumors on your end in terms of what's going on and any other things that have been coming out in the aftermath of what took place at the end of the season for the Jaguars? I mean, I've heard some stuff. Um, they've had a couple of teams that they wanted to interview uh, their defensive coordinators. They wanted to interview the uh, defensive coordinator from uh, the Panthers and the uh, Falcons, and both of them got blocked. Uh, but I think that's because they're both uh, in line to get interviews as head coaches. Uh, so um, that's uh, kind of interesting there after a year ago where I think, yeah, Press Taylor was getting inter or wanted to get interviews and or people wanted to interview Press Taylor and the Jaguars blocked it. So interesting there uh, to see that. Uh, but they have um, interviewed uh, or at least uh, attempted to interview a lot of other coaches. Uh, they were interviewing Chris Harris, the passing game defensive coordinator for uh, the Titans. Uh, they uh, talked to uh, Marquad Manuel, the uh, safety coach of the New York Jets, who also uh, interviewed for the Jaguars all the way back in 2016. Um, um, they uh, are interviewing the Baltimore passing game defensive coordinator and secondaries coach Chris Hewitt. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Shane, yeah, Shane Bowen. Uh, there as well, former defensive coordinator for the uh, Titans, Wink Martindale, uh, scheduled the interview on Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, which a lot of people are interested, I guess, in his defensive scheme uh, there. Anthony Weaver, defensive line on the uh, Baltimore Ravens. Uh, so, yeah, this is interesting to see. Uh, I mean, obviously, most of the defensive staff on the Jags getting laid off here uh and obviously i mean i think we all know that was kind of a scapegoat but at the same time the defense did play poorly in the second half of the season after the uh you know the monday night game um onwards um they just you know whatever reason went weren't the same but uh yeah that's that's what i've heard so far on that front uh, of course uh nothing on the gm or anything else that we want to see gone uh so we'll see how that plays out um and everything but yeah i haven't haven't heard much uh just uh you know rumors and stuff um looks like heard heard some stuff about trevor lawrence uh and pot potentially talking to uh the owner uh and their you know post conversation and sounds like sounds like he's with the fans he doesn't like uh he's not too fond of press and um doesn't really uh agree with the direction of team building that bulky has uh, implemented in place so far so uh we'll see we'll see how, what ends up happening there uh Jalen Hurts getting sacked here uh to end the drive there but um yeah we'll see we'll see how that plays out uh and uh, reportedly Doug Peterson and Shad Khan had their end of year conversations and stuff so interesting to see you know how that you know after you know what we talked about last week how how all that plays out but at least on the defensive coaches front from I think what the Jacksonville media has talked about who they thought would be a uh, uh, reporters thought they would be a good, good candidates. They look, they're looking in the right direction in that area. I'll say that at least. And there, I mean, I think the bigger deal, of course, you mentioned it is if uh, Shad Khan and the Khan family um, decide to move on from Trent Balky because that would put uh, Doug Peterson on deck, honestly, uh, as a likely or as somebody who would definitely be on the hot seat um, and has had a history of not being able to get along with um, front office because part of why he got ran out of Philly, I mean, not just because um, whatever, I'm whatever, the, I'm forgetting the the personnel guy gm whatever he's bought buddies with uh, jeffrey Lurie. yeah um, yeah yeah so i mean or no, that, no huey roseman howie roseman yeah howie roseman yeah, yeah with jeffrey Lurie. so um he's basically his ball licker the same way as um brian cashman is for hal steinbrenner um so that's the problem there um but i mean there's we're going to see what happens with that with Doug Peterson. And if he 
uh, will stick around. I mean, definitely a lot of pressure thinking about the you have franchise level players on both sides of the ball. Now, did Trevor Lawrence play like a franchise quarterback at times last this season? No, but there were other flashes of why he was the number one overall pick. Josh Allen is a franchise defensive player and uh, you need to build around him. And if they're not going to, I'm sure there's 31 other teams that would love to have his services because of how dynamic of a player he is. Um, so something to look at here uh, as we move forward. Uh, Chili Bowl took place. We'll start. We'll do a little bit of motorsports, obviously, because we are a motorsports show. Um, the 2024 Chili Bowl was a lot like the 2023 Chili Bowl in that the guy who came out on top in the A main after 55 laps was Logan Seavey for um, Kevin Swindell Racing. Uh, goes and holds off uh, pole sitter Buddy Kofoid. And um, Kofoid, that's basically one of the only things he has in one in his young career. Um, unfortunately, yet another year you'll have to wait uh, to get that golden driller. Um, Logan Seavey gets the win over Buddy Kofoid, Corey Day. Rounds out the podium. Dason Persley from the D main um, gets to fourth overall, or fourth, uh, finishes fourth. Um, also had serious injuries um, and had to come back from that too. Hank Davis was fifth. Uh, Shane Golobic, Tanner Carrick, Spencer based in Michael Facinto, and Jake Swanson for uh, Alex Bowman Racing rounds out the top 10. Uh, Carter Sarf finished 18th and Chase Briscoe made the A main, finished 21st at a DNF. So he had two cars, though, from himself and Sarf make the A main, which is huge considering how some of these big organizations that made it uh, that had most of the cars. Um, so credit to Briscoe and that team to go and get two cars into the A-Main uh, when you consider 365 cars were in this event. Um, in terms of the Dakar Rally, it's uh, they're going there in the second week. The Right now, the, um, the, the general ranking, the general, general classification... Uh, in motorcycles, America's Ricky Brabeck trying to go for uh, his second win in the Dakar Rally as a 42-second lead over Ross Branch. And um, his teammates, uh, uh, Nacho Corn Cornejo um, is third, and Adrian Van Beveren is fourth. Uh, defending race winner Kevin Benavides is fifth. Um, Tony, Toby Price, Daniel Snander, Sanders, world champion Luciano Benavides, Kevin's brother, Zvitko, Martin Michek, round out the top 10. So Brabeck uh, still has, we, or is that how many stages? So nine stages, uh, stage 10, yeah. Yeah, so there's still... There's still uh, four stages to go in this race uh, to see who will be, be the champion champions in their respective classes. Yeah, it's rally in rally. What is it in rally two? I'm gonna look for yeah, Roman Dumontier. Uh, two French riders, uh, Jean Luc Le Pen, and then Indian Harith Noah uh, is right now 8.53 behind in third place. So 
um, opportunity for an Indian rider to, oh, that's going to be 15 more yards. Um, he didn't slide, though, but they're going to call that as a personal foul. Um, Noah has a chance to go and win Indian rider. I would assume that's the first time if an Indian rider has ever won uh, in the Dakar. In the quads class, Manuel Andujar uh, leads Alexander Giroux and Gerard Barga. So that that battle, it's only Andujar and Giroud is 11.26 behind there. So that's in the quad category. So in the original... That any of that, who cares? Um, in the cars category, in the pro, in the what is that? In the four by two class, Layla Sand still is in third. She's only less than six minutes out of second, but they're nearly and two hours uh, out of the out of uh, the lead there so Sarah Dory still leads that class in um the ultimate car category Carlos Sainz is um in prototype category he Carlos Sainz leads the race uh by 24 seconds on Sebastian Loeb so it sounds like an old world rally championship event uh, Lucas Marias is uh, third De Mevius fourth Janil de Villiers fifth um, so trying to see who else is out there uh, nobody else that really kind of stands out uh, okay the challenger category Mitchell Guthrie and Kellen Walk the American duo lead by 34 minutes on Christina over Christina Gutierrez. And uh, Austin Jones is fifth. Uh, he has a chance to move up to fourth. So that could be two Americans or two Americans in the top five in that class. And then in SSV, Sarah Price is 12 minutes 32 behind in third place. So still has a chance to um, still has a chance to possibly get the victory, if nothing else, could possibly move up one step on the podium there. So another American, and of course her her boyfriend uh, leading the bikes category. So it could be a pretty big um, week here if they can finish things out. Um, they had a truck category in the futures. Um, trying to see that. Oh, Jamie Campbell is in fifth in the classics category. So that's the Dakar. Well, the race has still got another four days to go. And we'll talk about it next week on who ends up where in that. In Super Motocross is uh in super motocross got um i'm trying to go and look it up here super moto no, just give me a second here uh the super motocross championship uh, round two in San Francisco. Chase Sexton gets his first victory for uh, KTM in the 450 category. And I don't know why that's missing on their thing here. Um, the news results, yeah. Yeah, the latest results, so. New corner. 
Yeah, last chance. Sorry. SMX, the official results. So then the, and then in the 250 category, Hayden Deegan, or no, that's not it. Um, not showing from, uh, all right, I guess I'll go, go back, look at that. Guess we, uh, for, you know, nope, that isn't working. All right. Go to that. Yeah, Jordan Smith gets the victory in 250s. All right. The points heading to Anaheim 2. Chase Sexton leads the points by 8 over Jet Lawrence, who had a pretty rough uh, ride in the mud there. And uh, Eli Tomac and Aaron Plessinger tied for third. Dylan Ferrandis rounds out the top five. I mean, basically from Jet Lawrence or Jet Lawrence all the way to Ken Roxon's only separated by six points. In the 250 class, Jordan Smith leads Levi Kitchen by five points. RJ Hampshire, Garrett Marchbanks, Carson Mumford uh, round out the top five there. And um, yeah, Formula E. Pascal Verline gets the the victory in the season opener for Porsche. And then um yeah, Horn. He, uh, Pascal Verline uh wins pole and uh gets the race win. And uh over Sebastian Buemi and Nick Cassidy, who had the fastest lap in the race in his debut for Jaguar. Maxi Gunther, Mitch Evans round out the top five. Jean-Eric Verne, JQ, Stoffel Van Dorn, uh, world champion Jake Dennis, and Norman, his teammate Norman Natto, round out the top ten. Um... Jay Andruvula in his uh, debut for uh, in Formula E finished 16th with Maserati. Uh, Nick DeVries returning to Formula E uh, for Mahindra finished 15th. Eduardo Matara's teammate finished 13th, so struggles there. Um, in terms of DNFs, Luca De Grassi. Sergio Sete Camara, Robin Frines, and Antonio Felix da Costa. So on that polar opposites, you had the winner and then the guy who fin fell out of the race first. So we'll see what happens with Formula E as they move to uh, Saudi Arabia for two races in a couple weeks' time before they take a break uh, of about six weeks to, before they race in Sao Paulo. And, yeah, the SRX, I mean, Josh, we'll talk about this here. I mean, the SRX series, we talked about it here, and it was entertaining. It had a place, obviously, in the summer. Tony Stewart and Montag Group and having ESPN, CBS, and then ESPN come in to cover it. But in the end, uh, it looks like funding wasn't there to keep it going. Can make an argument that Paul Tracy wrecking every single one of their cars didn't help. Uh, but I, I guess, uh, it, unfortunately, uh, it was a good concept. But I think when they started it and they weren't able to sustain it, probably because you're not able to get all of the biggest drivers, even with it going to a Thursday night thunder or Wednesday night thunder, they weren't able to get the kind of drivers that they needed. Um, being a stock car kind of category, they weren't going to get that many open wheeler people to come in. Um, but IROX coming back, we don't really have much more news other than Everin Ham and Kaufman uh, are part of this thing Everham uh, used to work for IROC for Jay Signori 
and he collects a bunch of IROC cars. Uh, so it's entirely possible they could bring those things out of mouthballs and update them and kind of bring them back out for for classic purposes uh, as Tampa's trying to drive here with five under six minutes to go in the third quarter. Uh, but what are your thoughts? I mean, I guess what are your thoughts on SRX and um, as it probably goes away? I mean, it's kind of shocking, and I think the uh, IROC news was announced first, and when I heard that, I was like, well, that's kind of weird, because IROC, I mean, is basically, it's going to be, that sounds like the same thing as SRX, which is just IROC uh, on using kind of uh, road course or Trans Am cars as a base uh, type, you know, spec cars on short tracks, and it's kind of the same idea. Ray Evernham was one of the spearheads of that with Tony Stewart and now making the actual IROC name uh, come back. Uh, that's definitely a different uh, direction. And so, you know, I have two series kind of being kind of the same uh, type. It didn't really make a lot of sense. And then the next, I think, yeah, later on the SRX announcing that they're going to be spending the season and, you know, probably that's, that's it for, uh, that series, and you know, it's unfortunate because um, yeah, we saw a lot of great action through uh, through that series and uh, over the course of its couple of seasons. But I think um, Dan Baker just took a big sack there uh, on third down. But uh, I think you know, even after the second season, you could kind of start to see the uh, limitations of this series and you know what it was able to do. Obviously, we we've seen um, what what they were able to do and you know, 2022, and it's given rise to some big names like, you know, that are on the up, up and coming, uh, like, uh, Ernie Francis Jr., um, old guys getting another shot, like Tony Kanan, Elio Castroneves, uh, Marco Andretti getting a title, uh, in this series, uh, even though he didn't want to race, um, you know, other guys, uh, getting back into it, like Michael Waltrip, uh, Bobby Labonte and others, uh, so, uh, disappointing to see, but you know, I think you know, and it's kind of the same concept uh, over you know the last couple of years. They you know didn't really go away from. I mean, you know, I think what they had worked, but you know, they they didn't um, put in any variety uh, there uh, to try to make it more interesting, like maybe going on a road course or uh, something. Um, you know, like a small road course like Lime Rock Park or something like that, but. Um, you know, it would, it would have been interesting if they would have do that with, you know, these, uh, the cars that they were using, but, um, yeah, I think it just wasn't sustainable in the end. And, um, yeah, like you said, it was hard, hard to get the, uh, drivers to come out, especially when, you know, they got to finalize things, uh, you know, way, way far out, um, before things, you know, get too complicated and, it, you know, it's hard, hard to commit, hard to get drivers to come in. And then also you factor in uh, the uh, stock car guys kind of dominating, just kind of like, kind of like in the old Iraq where it ended up being just dominated by a lot of stock car guys. Um, you, know, you kind of see the same thing here. I mean, you had your open wheel guys that had heavy oval experience like uh, Elio and Tony Kanon kind of have success, Marco Andretti as well. But you know, at the end of the day, it was um, especially I think this past season just ended up being a lot of a lot of the. Uh, you know, stock car drivers, whether they're in NASCAR, the local favorite, come out and uh, perform. Uh, you know, in a you know better than the guys that are you know not used to driving this type of car uh, on an oval track. So, um, yeah, unfortunate, but um, you know, I think also just uh, kind of kind of uh, how it's probably going to end up. And you know, I think also you know Tony Stewart. You know, we've already talked about him with his commitment to drag racing and everything, and then he has the SRX, and you know, you don't know if there's going to be a conflict uh, with SRX and drag racing potentially, especially if he's going to be doing it full time. So, you know, it's hard to keep going, and you know, you you got too many things in your plate. So, you kind of seeing, kind of seeing Tony Stewart sort of uh, consolidate here. You know, giving up the All Star Circuit of Champions to Kyle Larson now this, and you know, focusing on drag racing and of course maybe 
maybe SHR is on the way too because they have no sponsorship uh, outside of maybe one guy. So we'll see. We'll see if that happens. But um, yeah, I think just the um, IROC coming back, uh, that could be interesting. And uh, I don't know if they'll go back to the old cars. I think those cars are you know, well out of date and it would take a lot of work to bring them up to uh, safety spec and everything. But if they go on to, you know, some of the big tracks, like what we used to see, uh, you know, back in the old days, you know, maybe it could be interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's something to, to look at if they go and bring it back for go and race at Daytona and Talladega or maybe Darlington. Um, I mean, who knows really at this point on, I mean, Tony won the first year in SRX over Ernie Francis Jr. Uh, second year was Marco over not, uh, I think Tony or not Tony. I don't know. I forget who it was. Um, and then in last year, no neck, Ryan Newman ended up getting the championship. Uh, so a couple guys, buddies of Tony, um, getting the wins, the point Josh made about Tony with the NHRA, I think, also plays a part. Notion of um, having a lot of things going on. Tony's getting rid of a, a lot of things. Um, uh, also, you know, Josh brought up the sprint cars, the all-star circuit of champions. Oh, is that a safety? Yes, it is. That's a safety. That's a safety. He didn't get rid of the ball. He was down before he got rid of the ball. It's a safety. So and then, he's definitely getting fired now. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and I don't know where the flag. Uh, oh, because he threw. Oh, yeah. An elite, uh, intentional grounding, too. Yeah. So um, that's that is a huge play by Le Levante David. Um I mean, you have to have better, better awareness of where you are on the field. You need to step up in that spot, and then he's running around like a dope, uh, or not, Levante David. I don't know who that was, uh, who made that play. But the coverage was really, really good. Finally, for the first time in a while, um, there was nothing there, and um, yeah. So, yep. Is that uh I'm trying to think who the hell is number ninety eight for oh for Nelson. Okay, yeah, good job by him. Gets uh Jalen Hurts and now they have a nine point lead and they'll also get the free kick uh from Philadelphia. So now it's a job to see if they can go and sustain a possession. Um, knock some time off the clock as well. Um, as I was saying in regards to Tony and what he's got going on, um, Josh mentioned it with um, getting rid of the uh, this All Star Circuit of Champions to uh, Larson and Brad Sweet. He um, also this is now going away. He's um, trying to, him and Leah Pruitt are trying to start a family. Uh, he's taking over Leah's ride in the top fuel category after racing in the top alcohol dragster class last year. So there's that. Of course, I'm um, bringing up uh, the Stuart Haas racing as of now uh, in Outside of Chase Briscoe, uh, who has funding for the full season, mostly from Mahindra and High Point and Ford Perform and uh, Ford Performance Racing Schools, uh, to make up the bulk of the schedule. Uh, Ryan Priest is essentially sponsored by Gene Haas and then United Rentals. Uh, but I don't think that's a full sponsorship. He's not fully sponsored, per se. Uh, Josh Berry, only just recently they announced that Sonny Delight is going to come back and do more races. 
but otherwise they don't have anything else. And um, Gagson doesn't have anything announced as of now. So it is a problem. Uh, it's interesting also because Gene Haas uh, just fired Gunther Steiner. So who knows what he's trying to do with his Formula One program. So there's a lot of moving parts going on there with uh, Tony Stewart and Gene Haas, to be fair. Uh, to uh, Oh, that is some Olay tackling. Oh, my God, he's taking it to the house. What the hell was that? The guy just, like, didn't even bother to tackle him. Bradbury just, like, didn't bother to tackle him. And then I don't know what the other guy did that didn't even try. Oh, she's good. Hey, baby. Um, uh... Trey Palmer with the 56-yard touchdown as James Bradbury made a made an executive decision to not bother to tackle him. And um, Odd Bowles trying to win a playoff game, another playoff game, and another coach that the Jets had that uh, they fired. Uh, it's interesting how that seems to work. Uh, and now he's in Tampa Bay and it's pretty darn successful. Uh, but I'm curious to see this replay. Bayer, bad angle. And yeah, so that is a huge, huge uh, turn of events. That safety leads to a free kick and then touchdown. And now they're up, uh, what was it, 16 points? 15-9. Uh, yeah, 16 points, so two possessions still. So now what will Philly do um, to be determined there? Uh, okay, so ARCA had their test, uh, the um, preseason test at Daytona. Um, the combined results for... Uh, the testing saw four Venturini Motorsports cars and the Joe Gibbs Racing, so five Toyotas in total, uh, lead lead in terms of their times, overall times for one lap. Um, Jake Finch over Tony Breidinger, Chris Wright, and Gus Dean, and then William Sawalich were the top five. Patrick Emerling, Andres Perez, who's racing the full count, full season, Marco Andretti, uh, trying to get um, get uh, certified to run, probably run a truck. Uh, Anthony Bello for Youngs, Tanner Gray for second Joe Gibbs, or another Joe Gibbs car, rounds out the top ten. The ageless Dale Quarterly was 11th. Shane Van Gisbergen driving for Pinnacle Racing Group. Same thing, trying to get certified to run the Xfinity Series at Daytona. Uh, LeVar Scott, Andres Perez's teammate for Rev Racing. Uh, the two favorites for the season championship. Uh, because I'm not sure who Venturini is running full time, other than Amber Balkin, and uh, William Sawalich isn't going to be able to run every race, I don't think. Um, so that's something to be seen. Uh, looking through some of the other Honeyman, who's going to be running Xfinity for Young's Motorsports, Andy Jankowiak, and Anunziata for. McClure Motorsports, a Jersey guy, LeVar Scott, Jersey guy, um, Emerling, of course, modified guy for many years, and has been running Xfinity, Andy J, upstate New York. Dude, <sighs> trying to see through Greg Van Alst, the defending race winner of the ARCA 200, uh, coming back from serious injuries late last year in trucks, uh, 24th. Trying to see anybody else um, that really stands out. Uh, 
Ezekiel List Linster, who comes from the NASCAR Europe uh, series, trying to make it into uh, NASCAR here. Her first going with ARCA, uh, Tim Richmond there, um, Amber Balkan I mentioned, Jess, Justin Bonsignor uh, trying to um, make a, get a start at Daytona in an ARCA car, um, the multi-time NASCAR modified tour champion. Uh, CJ McLaughlin, who brings out cautions every race at, in the Xfinity series. And then, speaking of cautions, Sean Hingarani, uh, this racing, f testing for fast track uh, this time uh, after racing for Venturini Motorsports last year. Landon Huffman racing or testing for Pinnacle Racing Group. And Takuma Koga, you know, uh, trying, to, trying to see who else. You know, Sean Core, Connor Mozak, Tyler Reif. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to see anybody else. Yeah, that's about it. So uh, nothing. Um, we'll see who ends up uh, racing or attempting to race at the uh, at the day in the ARCA 200 uh, here in a few weeks' time. There. Uh, the roar before the 24 takes place this uh, coming weekend. Um, and then, yeah, so the time of the jam pack. Uh huh. 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 Right, I'd rather take test session, the short six session GT. So I had a qualifying. Yeah, so they will. Uh, yeah, they will be qualifying. Um, uh, these cars uh, in this weekend prior to returning neck the following week for the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Um, no, the, yeah, so the field 59 entries for the the Rolex 24 at Daytona in the GTP category, there'll be 10 cars, two cars from Porsche Penske Cadillac with both Ganassi Cadillac Racing and Wheel and Engineering Cadillac, Wayne Taylor Racing with two Acuras, BMW with uh, Team ALL, as lead, if you would say, and um, Proton Competition and JDC Miller Motorsports with the two independent Porsche 963s. In LMP2, 13 entries, 12 of them Oracas, one Liget for Sean Creek Motorsports. Uh, uh, crowd United Autosports comes over to the uh, IMSA series this year with two cars. Uh, CrowdStrike racing by APR lost last year in this race on a photo finish. Um, Riley Motorsports with Gar Robinson and company move over to this class. We got AF Corsa in, in this uh, field this weekend or this or this race and um dragon speed nao racing gt pro 13 entries um bmw corvette mclaren lexus lamborghini aston martin ferrari ford with the mustang with multimatic motorsports amg Mercedes AMG with uh, Sun Energy One racing because they're race running three platinums. Uh, Jewel Gunan, Lucas Stoltz, Mauro Engel, along with Kenny Abel, um, and then AO Racing uh, with their Porsche, and then GTD twenty three entries. Uh, 
largest class, obviously, of the group. And um, that will we'll give you more details um, on that and in the whole field, what takes place next week. Um, other news, it looks like uh, Kaz Grala might end up being uh, uh, driving for Rick Ware Racing as a teammate with uh, Justin Haley. Andy's Frozen Custard, who has been a sponsor for uh, her Anthony Alfredo in the past, uh, will be sponsoring Xfinity Series champion Cole Custer for a few races. I mentioned CJ McLaughlin. He's going to be racing for RSS Racing partial schedule. Celsius stays with Colleague. And uh, they will be the primary sponsor for AJ Allmendinger as he returns to the Xfinity series. Let me talk about, yeah, so um, Bubba Wallace, John Hunter Nemechek, Corey Heim are going to be racing in the IMSA uh, Michelin Pilot Challenge in the GT4 category. Global. Industrial will sponsor, continue to sponsor um, Austin Hill and also sponsor Kyle Busch this year. Connor Zilch, Zilch will come to, will eventually come to NASCAR. Uh, he's won in uh, Mazda MX-5 Cup for uh, Shea um for um why am I forgetting her name? Follow her on Instagram. Um for Shay Holbrook's team. Uh he's won in any number of categories, but now he has been signed by Trackhouse Racing. I wonder where they're gonna put him since some don't they only have two car three cars. I they they're, they seem to be hiring more drivers than they have cars uh these days, but he is a prospect, long-term prospect, for sure. Uh, going on there in the Xfinity Series, you know, spotters, we talked on that. Uh, yeah, so there's that. Uh, I mentioned Gunther Steiner getting let go by Gene Haas. Um, Alan Permain, the longtime Renault or the uh, Enstone team uh, uh, higher up there, is going, it looks like, to Alpha Tori or whatever they'll be called. Uh, Toyota's making leadership change for their, uh, their team or for their, their whole program. And uh, was a machine gun Kelly is going to be performing at the Clash in halftime for whoever cares about that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's yeah, that's about it there in terms of the uh, racing news. Was there anything else that you saw, Josh, that I missed? I think so. I think that's basically everything. All right. So, uh, will Chad Green, Dean, uh, yeah, I don't know who that is, who any of those people are. Uh, I, well, yeah, I'll add, I, going on NHRE.com just out of, uh, curiosity, uh, Daniel Wilkerson will go and take over, he'll go from being a tuner to, back to being a driver uh and he'll be taking over for his uh his father in the skag power equipment uh funny car so that's uh interesting turn of events there daniel wilkerson is a good crew, but you know his dad has been at it for so many years won big races and now um he is going to retire and move over to um, they're going to flip roles now. He'll be the tuner, and uh, Daniel Wilkerson 
will be the driver. And uh, Philly makes a field goal to make it, uh, but there's a flag there. And then another flag. There seems to be flags like every play. Uh, yeah, so that's... Yeah, that's NHRA. I'm trying to see what else, if there's anything else that really kind of stands out. Um, Grand Prix Festival. Yeah, that's not it. There. Uh, go back. Do all that. Uh, uh. Yeah, I don't see anything else there. So uh, we will move forward here. Um, NFL divisional round preview and picks. First game on the docket will be the Houston Texans going to the Baltimore Ravens. Now, the Baltimore Ravens were the uh, best record in the NFL they destroyed the 49ers on Christmas. Uh, Mar Jackson's going to be the MVP of the league. Um, and almost a touchdown there. Good defense by uh, Tampa Bay there. But um, CJ Stroud going on the road for a second playoff game. They uh, put up, a, they played really, really well. Uh, last Saturday, but can they go on the road and somehow or another make the upset? That's the question. And I don't know if that's going to be the case. Um, it's going to take a lot. Baltimore's got the week off and they're rested. They got some, probably get some guys back. And, you know, they'll be able to kind of make some more adjustments to their offense. Todd Munkin and that offense, that defense has been one of the better defenses this whole year. Uh, so it's going to be a tough ask to go to Baltimore. Um, and also Houston being a, a dome team having to play. I mean, they do play outdoors against, uh, what is it, two of the teams i'm trying to think or yeah two of the teams in their division are out, outdoor teams but um well uh, um, are they able to go and deal with the cold i mean D'Amico ryan's i'm sure that they'll be prepared but can they handle the pressure personally unfortunately i want i i would want houston to win because of my rooting for uh D'Amico Ryans and for because CJ Stroud is such a dynamic player, but I think Baltimore gets the win there. Uh, do you see anything different, Josh, or you figure Baltimore gets to host the AFC Championship game a couple weeks' time? I don't think I see anything different. I think Houston, I think it could give them a, a, a real, real good fight. But I think uh, the defense is going to hold through for uh, uh, Baltimore, and um, I, I think uh, you know CJ Stroud's done a, done a really good job. But you know I think uh, he is down a couple of weapons, you know mainly Tank Dell. So um, I'm going to go with uh, Baltimore here. I don't really think it's going to be any other any other way uh, different. So yeah, the Ravens. Um, uh, go out and uh, I mean the defense for Houston has been suspect at times throughout uh, throughout the season. I mean they definitely did good job against Flacco here, uh, but you know we've seen you know they gave up thirty points to the Jets uh, and everything. So yeah, you know, that's one thing. Um, yeah, you know, they gave they gave up. I mean the Browns. I mean granted Stroud was hurt, so maybe that was a factor. But you know they did give up that game. Uh, you know, against the Browns in the regular season in, in, um, I mean, I think it was in, in their own house, but still, um, you know, that's still pretty big, uh, defensive domination there, uh, or, um, letdown that they had in that one. So, and we know what Lamar Jackson can do. Um, and it seems like he's just evolved, uh, to be balanced as both a runner and a passer and is, uh, you know, learned how to take, uh, when, when he needs to run, but also, extend the play but uh find the open man passing so um yeah i think 
I think uh here for Baltimore it's their it's theirs to, you know, win. Um but you know at the same time, you know, they've been on rest for a week now and the starter's been on rest for two weeks. So um I mean it's not gonna be easy, I think, but I think they're they're gonna pull it out. So, you know, they just have to, you know, play ball and you know, I think Harbaugh is gonna be motivated because his brother won the championship so in college, so he's gonna wanna go out and try to, you know, go and get the NFL championship in the Super Bowl. Yeah, and now you see uh, stuff going on on the sideline for Philadelphia. Uh, Dallas Goddard going at Jalen Hurts, and Jalen Hurts basically not having any acknowledgement of it. Um, Devontae Smith also um, just absolutely... uh, just staring into the abyss, just doesn't know what to do. Uh, Jason Kelsey looks like a guy that's about to retire, even though he is talking to his uh, coach there. But um, Jeffrey Lurie does not look happy. And uh, I guess the implosion, unless uh, Baker Mayfield gives them the ball back uh, and they score... Uh, oh man, that was a tight, tight window there, but he made that catch. Will they give them the first down to be determined there? But we'll see what happens with that. Second game, uh, the primetime game on Saturday night will be the Green Bay Packers going to Santa Clara and uh, the Gene Field uh, Levi Stadium to play the San Francisco 49ers uh, coming off of a couple of weeks of rest themselves uh, they didn't beat LA in week 18 with a bunch of backups uh, but they're um, coming back here uh, this week after time off for a good amount of this season they were the best team in the NFC uh, one of, if not the best team in the NFL, too. Uh, Brock Purdy is an MVP candidate and still should be. I honestly think Christian McCaffrey would be the MVP of the league, but they made it an, and they made it a quarterback award now. So I guess offensive player of the year is the best he's going to do. Um, a lot of guys made the Pro Bowl. A lot of guys were all pros. There were some snubs on the 49ers side. Green Bay's defense has been, uh, I mentioned earlier, they're not exactly considered one of the better defenses in the league. Oh, man, that was a big play, and they caught that one. So he moved up. Uh, Mike Evans makes that big catch there. Uh, big play. Slay gave up a big play just there. Um And, uh, I mean, uh, can Jordan Love continue this run? Can the Green Bay Packers go and continue this run? A long-time rivalry over many years. Uh, Favre had, and Mike Holmgren had the match over San Francisco outside of the catch game um, with Owens. They um, then, with A.A. Ron, it kind of went the other way. San Francisco has been able to kind of hold over on Green Bay since with when A.A. Ron was around. Uh, Raheem Mostert running for 200, whatever, 20 yards and three touchdowns in the NFC Championship game. What is it about, was it five years ago? And uh, but Jordan Love, he gets an opportunity here against one of the best defenses in the NFL. Mooney Ward, one of the probably should have been an all pro at at defensive back, but they didn't put him up there. Uh, One of the best cover corners in the NFL. And they are just one of the best defenses. And will they be able to advance? It was been it's been a pretty ugly week for higher seeds but we talked about Baltimore and uh, for me and it's not a bias uh, at all 
Uh, I honestly do believe the San Francisco 49ers are, have the things in place to go where they need to go, which is to Las Vegas and um, get the job done. So the first piece of that is to go and beat the Green Bay Packers on Saturday night, which uh, they will do, uh, in my opinion. But what say you, Josh, in regards to that game? I mean, I think it's going to be a tough game. You know, the Green Bay Packers, like we saw uh, in this last game against the Cowboys, they ran the ball pretty well. Uh, but, you know, I, I think, again, the 49ers, I think, you know, they uh, they got unfinished business with uh, what happened last year in the NFC Championship. And I think they, you know, really want to get back to that point. You know, obviously, Brock Purdy's put up a lot of numbers. You know, you can question whether he's really a system quarterback or um, if he's, you know, for real and everything, but, um, you know, I think they, uh, I think they're a step above, uh, the Packers and, you know, every way. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, as long as their offensive line can hold up in this game, I think they'll, they'll come out okay and, uh, they'll come out with the win. So, um, yeah, I think San Francisco goes out here, they win the game and then they'll face whoever wins, uh, the Lions and, uh, uh, whoever wins this game here more than likely the Bucks. So we'll get into that in a minute. But that's uh, yeah, that's what I'm thinking as well. Yeah, and it'll be both of those teams on Saturday. The number one seeds coming off of the time off. If there will be any rust, something to look at though. Uh, both games should be interesting. Uh, with the teams that are coming in, young teams. Uh teams of the future in both the Houston Texans and the Green Bay Packers. Um, right now, the Buccaneers are driving. Mike Evans has made a couple of big catches. Uh, they're now inside of the 30-yard line with seven minutes to go. Yeah, Howie Roseman, somebody that should probably be getting sent to uh, along with Sirianni. But... um. The yeah, so that's going on there. Looks like Tampa Bay, uh, unless something crazy happens, is going to be moving on to play against the Detroit Lions in Detroit. Now, Tampa's had uh, it's been it hasn't been pretty uh, tonight by any means, but in terms of uh, their situation and with Baker Mayfield, with Mike Evans, and a lot of these guys that are on this team. Uh, the question is, will they be able to keep up, uh, put up enough points against Detroit's dynamic offense and all their playmakers? Jamison Williams was someone who uh, had a lot of big plays on Saturday, or I mean yesterday. Um, in the game, and he's a player who runs a four three forty and all that stuff, and he's somebody who can get past the defense. And there was times during this game right now, still going on, that Tampa Bay didn't seem to have a have any any answers for Devonte Smith. So, uh, Jamison Williams has a lot of similar characteristics to Devonte Smith. Um, running backs, running game is more dynamic for Tampa Bay, albeit, you know, they're not exactly the most efficient running team. And um, Detroit has a lot of momentum going on. Jared Goff, he definitely wants to prove that he wasn't the issue uh, as much as Sean McVay and Les Snead made, it, made him out to be. Um, they did get the chip though, so I guess it doesn't really matter if um, it worked out the way they wanted to, and they got uh, they got what they wanted. Uh, Slay looks like he's hurt there, so they're gonna probably go to a commercial with six eleven to go. Um, Jason Kelsey still still going and. Oh, 
something to do with his back there. So uh, Detroit at home uh, with a little uh, being able to stick around and uh, have time to prepare, looking at both of these teams, MCDC wanting to take his team to the NFC Championship game uh, would be against the San Francisco 49ers based on our picks. And whoever wins this game uh, would have had a hard time against Detroit on best case scenario. But Tampa, if they get past this, which it looks like they will, uh, it's a whole different bag of tricks to go against Detroit. Detroit's been able to make have some big wins. They did go and take a huge L to Green Bay on Thanksgiving. They did uh, get screwed against Dallas, uh, which is would have given them the number two seed instead of the three. They would have ended up having to play Green Bay again if that had worked out that way. Um, but... Either way, I think Detroit gets the victory and advances to go to the NFC Championship game, which would be uh, insane for Detroit's fan base. Um, well, I'll ask you, Josh, do you see anything different on that one? I I have to, I mean, we're so far, we're good. I think the one we're going to end up de- um, getting different on is the Chiefs and the Bills. But yeah, I think this, yeah, I Again, I think the Lions probably should be the favorite here. Uh, the Bucks, I mean, they've done an admirable job here, but um, you know they've they've had issues with their defense throughout the year. I mean, they do have a good run defense, uh, so but their pass defense is uh, not quite on the same level. Um, and defense um, um, or their offense, I think uh, for uh, Baker Mayfield, I think he's going to have have some trouble. I think going up against the you know, very physical defense in the uh, Detroit Lions. So, you know, that's that's what I think is going to happen. I think it's going to, you know, be the Lions advancing to the NFC Championship game versus uh, the 49ers. So that uh, should be an interesting one. But, you know, one thing I will mention, you know, we talked about Jacksonville and their coaching search. And, you know, Detroit also was a team that reset after 2020. And, um, you know, they traded away Jared Goff uh, and everything. And then, uh, you know, for or you know they they traded for uh, Jared Goff and gave away Matthew Stafford and everything and you know hired Campbell and their GM and everything and you know they've had uh their roster you know looks a lot like where where Jacksonville wants to be I think so you know, they made made a lot of good picks over the last three years and you know they haven't spent uh, as much money in free agency so they've they've done the draft and develop thing uh very well whereas Jacksonville hasn't drafted and develop as much uh only in some positions and uh uh they've spent a lot of money in free agency and we'll need to retool the roster hopefully this week uh this uh off season so that's one difference there and that's something i think that you know if you're the you know part of the front office whether you're bulky or shot con i think you need to something you need to consider is as far as the the lions go uh you know as as they continue to go so we'll we'll see how that plays out but as far as this game uh, yeah, I think I think the Lions advance here, and you know they go would be it would be a shocking upset if they if they lost, but I think they go here to the uh, NFC Championship. Yep, and uh, with all of that, it leads to the box office matchup, uh, one of the big rivalries, uh, so to speak, in the NFL. Kermit the Frog, Patrick Mahomes, and the Kansas City Chiefs for the first time in his career have to go on the road in a playoff game, and he will go against Josh Allen and the Buffalo Bills. Um, Oh, he threw a freaking how. He literally just threw that up for, he just threw it up for grabs, and somehow or another Chris Godwin caught that. That is insane. Uh, they all got, they all got uh, shopping. They all got the shopping bags on their heads. The Philly fans are giving up. So this has been quite a weekend uh, for uh, fan bases that I think have 
bigger egos than they deserve. Um, Philly's getting fucked hard. Um, they're done. Uh, 32 to 9 now. Um, but Buffalo and Kansas City, um, I've been, uh, I've been going and talking about all these other ones, but I figure I'll switch it up here since it sounds like we're going to differ here. So um, uh, what are you thinking, Josh, in regards to this matchup again uh, between two of the best quarterbacks in the NFL uh, and a matchup that we have seen many times over here in recent years, 14 seconds, uh, where... Buffalo thought they had it won. They were going to host an AFC championship game. And then Kermy went and did what he had to do and um, ended up winning. A, or, or no, they ended up losing to that. that They ended up losing to Joe Burrow. So that was nice. Um, but uh, what are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, you know, what I'm thinking here is um, if you look at I mean, you got to look at their defenses, I think, first off. Uh, the Bills, I mean, they've got a lot of injuries on their defense right now. Their you know linebackers are injured, and uh, some of their d- defensive backs are injured. So that might tilt the game back into um, uh, the Chiefs' favor. But, you know, the defensive line on the Bills is, you know, good, I think. And uh, the, the Chiefs, um, you know, I mean, even though they had, had offensive problems this year, I mean, at least in this past game, maybe it's because they went up against the uh, the Dolphins and a finesse team, but you know, it looks like uh, Mahomes uh, was able to, you know, take take the shorter throws. And not saying that he doesn't, but um, you know, it was really from a you know what they've what they're known to do. They they went and had a different game plan here, and they are also able to throw very aggressively though in those conditions. So uh, you know, for Mahomes. Um, you know, if he does more of what he did in this past game, I think they go back to the AFC Championship game. He'll be on the road again, so um, and they'll they'll go up against the the Ravens. But uh, if the Ravens win this one, uh, but um, yeah, Mahomes in that matchup, I mean, it's gonna be interesting with you know the kind of the cards stacked against him as they have been all season. But you know, could could get you know interesting there, and then of course the uh, Okay, the Bucks got another touchdown, so yeah, stick a fork in the Eagles there. So uh, what a collapse! But uh, uh, on the other hand, you know, Josh Allen. I mean, in the middle of the season, they looked like they were on the verge of a collapse as well. But you know, seemingly they've uh, turned it around. I think they they just started running the ball better, um, and I think they finally found their balance. But, yeah, I think that's that's what their problem has been is they just never had enough balance uh, with Josh Allen, and you know, you'd go and do too much. So I think. You know, if he figures it out, you know, I think passing wise, it's you know, it's gonna be interesting. So, uh, and the Chiefs, I think the Chiefs have a better defense this year. Um, you know, they've again, you know, Legarius Sneed on the back end as corner, and uh, Chris Jones, uh, Carl Aftis, uh on the defensive line, linebacking core. So, uh, Nick Bolton as well. So, um, yeah, that's gonna be an interesting matchup uh, there defensively, and this might be more of a defensive game. I feel like. Uh, than it has been in years past, like we saw earlier this year when the Bills came into uh, Arrowhead and defeated them. So um, it's gonna be an interesting one. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the Chiefs here. I I hate to keep picking them, but I think uh, you know I, I think they can go and uh, their defense is a little bit better than uh, the Bills are at this point right now. So uh, I think they they advance the NFC Championship. Uh, you know, against the Ravens. As Dallas Goddard uh, lays on the ground looking dead after Slay had to get Carter off the field. Um, and Dallas Goddard got a P.I. in the process, too. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, for me... I mean, I look at the momentum you go and um oh, he got hit low, that's what it is, and hyper extended, oh, okay, yeah, there's a hyper extension there, 
They call that pass interference. I guess because it's over past five yards. Okay, so he it's walking off. Um, for me, I mean, I lo- you look at momentum and the way that Josh Allen has played over the last six weeks. Uh, he they yeah, you got the you got the good, the bad, and the ugly, and it could all happen in one game with Josh Allen, but he was able to come through today and play within himself play a clean game nice simple a uh, couple hundred yards and uh, three total touchdowns and honestly at some i mean they've been the momentum has been uh has been there uh with them yes a lot of injuries for buffalo uh, that uh that has been an effect that has affected them, but I also know that Josh Allen's there and um, the Bills Mafia being able to be at home, knowing they beat Kansas City in Kansas City earlier in the season, albeit it took Kadarius Tony being a moron, but um, they they were there, they were in the mix, they seem to always be in the mix against Kansas City in general. So if it's going to come down, I mean, one thing I do, I am concerned about is their kicking game uh, because today uh, their kicker didn't seem to be all that good. Uh, Their punter uh, pulled a hamstring, I think, or groin or something. So that that was also a problem. Uh, So their kicking game is uh, interesting right now. Um, we'll see how that works. Special teams, when it comes to close games and you're talking about defensive battles, special teams is, uh, plays a big role and Kansas city does have one of the better special teams. But with, even with all of that, I'm going to go with the Buffalo bills at home and, uh, they would end up going to Baltimore for an AFC championship game. Um, Either way, I think the AFC championship game would be quite interesting uh, because of the quarterback matchup. Uh, But I'm going to say Buffalo there, um, personally. Uh, So we'll go while Phil picks Buffalo. So, uh, three out of four games, we both uh, picked the same. Say last year, last week, three out of six games, uh, we picked the same. So, we'll see what happens with that uh, next week. So now, um, Josh, let us know what's going on uh, in iRacing and uh, what you're going to be doing in regards to that here um this week in uh the sim segment yeah of course uh, i mean as we talked about at the top of the show you know did the uh open wheels or not i keep wanting to say open wheels 500 because that's where i saw it from but uh the uh us 500 at fontana on uh i racing race spot tv uh presenting the race uh two splits uh the top split of filled with uh drivers that or i racers that compete in the you know, highest level of i racing and have you know competed in multiple special events uh and regularly compete in the broadcast uh split um you know the very top split of uh indycar so um i uh, was able to compete in that in second split uh you know, ran in uh some uh good pack racing here at fontana um uh it was a very very open open setup so i had to you know find something put something together and um it had a good setup, I think, on in terms of speed, but uh, handling. I think you know, being able to, because um, I I like to run the top at at Fontana, run you know, run the high line, uh, keep the speed up there. Um, but the uh, the bottom line is like where you really need to go to to make passes, and you know, after a tire run, as you got into a fuel run, and um, 
you know, the tires wore out, uh, started to get, I mean, I think it's characteristic of Fontana anyways, but it starts to get really treacherous trying to, to run the bottom to make a move. And you can start to feel the car start to slide off of the corner, even in the middle lanes. So, um, you know, you had to be really conservative and kind of make your, your moves early on and kind of hope other people would kind of start to stumble. Uh, if they try to run the bottom, you could run the top. So, um, you know, that's, that's what my strategy was to kind of just stay at the top, uh, as long as I could and just ride that until the end. But, um, lap 59 or, you know, they had a caution come out before that. We had a restart in lap 59 and cars in front of me started to stack up and, you know, I, I was trying to time it so I could maybe make some passes on the bottom and also try to avoid potentially getting in, in a stack up. And so I went to the bo uh, the inside on the restart, which you can't do. Uh, you can't pass on the inside before it restarts. So I was also trying to avoid the penalty there uh, before the start finish line. So I had to uh, tap the brakes a little bit to try and, uh, you know, not get that penalty, but uh, end up getting run into the back because I think somebody else had the same idea and ended up getting run into the back uh, of and then spun out and crashed in, into the wall. So um, that's okay. I mean, it's not a big deal. It's not, you know, like we're racing for a prize or anything like that or had to pay to, uh, you know, be in this and everything. And, you know, um, first 500 mile, well, it wasn't a 500 mile race. It was a 500K actually, not a, a 500 lap. So it was a 156 lap race. But, uh, you know, first long distance indie car race in quite a bit uh, and haven't really competed on this large of a scale uh, in a while in terms of field size and uh, just uh, the platform that we're competing on with race spot broadcasting the race on YouTube. So, you know, uh, it was definitely hyper focused uh, for this one, but, um, and I could tell because when I stopped, I had a, a little bit of a headache for a bit, but uh, um, yeah, just uh, interesting, interesting race. You know, a lot of pack racing throughout uh, that event, uh, but, Tire wear was a factor throughout, as I talked about, so that was interesting. Um, would have liked to get in a scenario where we could have um, had green flag pit stops, but I don't, I don't think they ever really came out to have any uh, green flag pit stops, but um, was running in the top 10, so uh, or just on the, the edge of the top 10 uh, there, so um, you know, would have liked to have been able to continue more, but um, you know, that just made I don't know, maybe my mistake trying to veer to the inside uh, before the restart there. Maybe could have just stayed patient and held my line uh, and, you know, try you know, something. But, you know, it is what it is. So we'll just have to you know, learn from that and move forward uh, as we go forward here on the iRacing season in IndyCar. So, you know, just glad glad to be back on uh, IndyCar, you know, with, uh, I mean, we've been racing in the past since the, you know, the, uh, spot the license had stopped but um you know on the official you know level where now we get to actually run the indycar series uh schedule and uh you know run the indy 500 and all that glad to have that back so you know that's what's important here uh, and everything you know no matter you know who won the race or who didn't win the race um you know just having the ability to compete uh like that on the in the game uh i think that's important and then also just you know for um outlets like race spot to and other you know places just to be able to broadcast races on on youtube or wherever uh without worrying about violating the rules of of the license and everything and having not having a permission now that they can do it they're free and they can you know have that i think it'll help uh the platform and certainly have maybe it'll help grow interest in into the regular indycar series uh and you know if people get interested in the sim indie car they'll get interested in the real life indie car so um yeah that's that's uh kind of the story there um and everything is cool cool to be on youtube i guess for a little bit even though it was just uh bits and pieces there so that's cool so glad to be in that uh, and everything so uh, of course also did run run the regular i racing indie car open or f fixed oval series as well and ran at pocono so um ran there a couple times and had some good good results there so uh yeah that's uh that's all i did in sim racing this week or this past week uh this next upcoming week is the rolex 24 
uh, on iRacing. I don't know yet if I'll do it. Uh, I haven't really gotten in connections with anybody uh, and, um, and everything, and uh, I don't know what I want to do with my weekend yet. So, um, yeah, it would, would be a commitment, and I'd have to start practicing and everything for, for that this week. So if I do, so uh, I don't know yet if I will, but I'd have to find find a drive or something and uh been i did look around i mean there's plenty of people there just there for the fun of it and you know are very seemed very uh friendly to beginners so we'll see but um you know would would have to set set aside some time to be able to do that so uh we'll see but yeah of course i did stream uh this past week for that us 500 so and i can maybe catch all the way up until you know where the crash happened uh Twitch TV slash UCO2, so go in there and watch and go and watch the streams and everything. So uh glad glad to be able to be able to do that and you know, be able to compete with other other people that are into IndyCar and uh be able to compete on that level. So um yeah, of course, uh as always, you know, Twitter, JP Huffline, and of course I already said the Twitch, so um, you know, you can see all our hot takes there, see everything we have, uh, you know, see all the takes on football and uh you know sports and everything like that so you'll go in there and follow and then of course uh uh the youtube page where we have everything of course our video last week where we incinerated the jacksonville jaguars uh on there at grip Street podcast on youtube go in there and subscribe follow our page so um of course this one will be up there and um we'll have we'll have evidence of whether or not we'll be right in our predictions so people People want to comment on there and say, "Oh, we were wrong about this game or whatever." I guess they could potentially comment on there, but you know that's where our stuff will be at. So yeah, go and follow our page there and subscribe. As Jason Kelsey gets off the field, he goes and I think that's his wife there. He's pretty emotional. Everybody was going up to him. I think it speaks a lot. It might. I mean, I was pretty sure it was the end, but the way uh, Kelsey looked there right at the end and uh, the emotion in his face, I think uh, it will be the end of a great career for Jason Kelsey, uh, one of the great leaders in in the NFL, one of the great uh, players in terms of being at the center position. As well, it's going to be an interesting off season uh, for the Philadelphia Eagles. A lot of change going to be taking place there as Tampa Bay gets to go to Detroit. Baker Mayfield going for three thirty and three scores, and um, a great playoff performance. Second. That says they had posted only the fifth or fifth quarterback, who was the number one overall pick, to uh, win for two different teams in the playoffs. So that's uh, something. Uh, credit to Baker Mayfield. Wonder if Tampa Bay will go and give him an extension. Uh, that's something to look at for sure. You can find me at PG Matthew twenty eight on Twitter. You can find me at Philip G Matthew twenty eight on Instagram. Uh, been on a, a Facebook a little bit more recently. We'll see if I continue. I'm trying to sell stuff on there, bowling equipment. No, uh, hopefully, can actually talk about bowling because it's been pretty shitty uh, for a while this season. Our teams are the teams I'm in, involved on are not so good, but um, trying to turn that around. Got other things going on. Uh, made six months. Uh, it's sobriety, so that's uh, last week, so that was huge. And um, continuing on that front. And um, yeah, always, as always, great um, to have to be on and Josh and I going and doing this thing. It's uh, been a fun deal, and we continue it over 200 episodes. So we'll be back next week for episode 204. Uh, preview the Rolex 24 at Daytona, preview the championship weekend for the NFL conference championship weekend. And, uh, what is it? Rally Monte Carlo will be up there. Formula E. Uh, it'll be my birth. It's my birthday week too, next week. So, uh, leading up to that, 
and then another year around the sun. So we'll uh, get into all all that stuff next week on the Grip Strip Podcast. So for Josh, I'm Phil. Take care. Thanks for listening and subscribing. Uh, let your friends know about or anybody who's interested in motorsports or football or whatever about this show. Uh, we'll let you know about all those different things here on the Grip Strip Podcast. So we will see you next time. Take care.